Hello and welcome to Volvork. I'm Brian Watrous. This is the ninth in a 10 part video series in which I'm teaching you how to automate with the Realize Orchestrator. Now in the previous videos, we've covered a lot of concepts and techniques and methods in order to learn how to use various parts of Orchestrator. In this video and the next video, we're gonna be putting all those pieces together to perform real world tasks. So let's actually jump in and take a look at a demo. There we go. Okay, so I found my Windows desktop and in here I'm logged into the VRO client and as you can see we've got our three hello worlds. Enough of this hello world stuff, it's time to do some real world stuff. So let's take a look at the vSphere web client. I'll explain why in a moment, but I'm logged into the vSphere web client and I'd like to illustrate something that you may or may not be familiar with. It's a mechanism in vSphere known as a data center folder. If you right click your vCenter folder and choose new folder, you're able to create a new folder. Uh, by the way, depending upon where you are and where you click, different types of folders will get created. Uh, in this particular context, when you click on a vCenter server, what you're going to end up creating is called a data center folder which is related to, but not the same thing as a data center. So this is my data center folder, and this is a data center. Now, in this particular uh, environment here, uh, there's really no need for a, a data center folder. Data center folders are typically used when you have not just one data center, but lots and lots and lots of data centers, and you want a way to organize them. So just to illustrate this here, I've created one data center folder and I'm gonna put my data center into that data center folder. Let's hit expand and as you can see, it otherwise works the same. Now that's one type of folder that you can create. You can also create other types of folders. Uh, for instance, you can create host folders, you can create VM folders. In fact, there's even more types of folders behind the scenes that you don't ordinarily see here in the vSphere web client. Okay, so now you, that you've seen me create a data center folder, you're probably wondering why I did that, especially if I have so few data centers. I'll show you. Let me, let me actually scoot things around a little bit here. I'll scoot this over here. So as you can see, I'm once again in the Vero client. And the reason why I'm coming here is I'd like to go into the orchestrator inventory. In the orchestrator inventory, you can see I have the vCenter server plugin installed. So this first line here is the vCenter plugin. This line here represents my actual vCenter server. It's actually equivalent to what you see over here. But to continue to expand, notice that the next couple of levels look a little different when you compare the vSphere client interface. Actually, let's close this one up for a moment. Don't want to look there yet. Notice that the vSphere web client interface, the hierarchy that we see here in the web client, looks a little different over here in the orchestrator client. Both of these inventories, both the orchestrator inventory and the vSphere client view of the inventory, are showing the same inventory. This is the inventory, in both sides, this is the inventory of our vCenter server. What's going on here is that they display the inventory in slightly different ways. For instance, notice over here in the web client, I have the data center folder that I just created, but over here in the orchestrator inventory, I have that data center folder and another data center folder called data centers. Now you don't see data center folders over here in the web client, and you will never see that because what this thing here is called data centers is it's a data center folder that's created for you automatically whenever you install a vCenter server you automatically get a data centers folder created for you but it's hidden from you the data centers folder is hidden from you if you're using the vSphere web client the reason why it's done that way is the vSphere web client is trying to provide a, a simplified easier experience for the vSphere administrator but we as orchestrator developers uh, at times want to see the entire inventory, uh, the, the entire hierarchical structure, and even if we didn't want to, as an orchestrator developer, we need to understand that full hierarchy. So this is 
You can think of data centers as a data center folder that gets created automatically, it's hidden, and it's there so that whenever we do create data center folders, they'll end up in that location. Just to really drive that point home, I'm gonna create another data center folder over in the vSphere web client. I'll call this one another data center folder. And watch over on the left side, and you'll notice that whenever I create a data center folder over in the web client, the data center corresponding data center folder shows up in the orchestrator inventory because these aren't really two inventories. They're just two different tools for viewing the same vCenter inventory. All right, tell you what, let me get rid of another data center folder. I don't actually need that. Let's see, remove it from inventory. Am I sure? Yes, I am. Kiss it goodbye. Okay, so uh, if you were to continue drilling down further into the orchestrator view of the vCenter inventory, you'll notice that when you get down to the, the data center level, you see these things called host folder, a VM folder, a data store folder, and a network folder. Again, you don't see those over in the vSphere web client. But if, if I were, for instance, in the VMs and templates view, and I decided, actually I already do have one. Um, I didn't create this, but whether uh, this VM folder is created or I create one myself, let me create one. So my VM folder, any VM folders that are created over in the vSphere web client are going to show up in our, v, uh, in our orchestrator inventory. You just gotta look in the right place. So I've got my data center folder. It's got a data center there called vvork. This VM folder is created by default as are these others. Host, VM, data store, and network are all created by default, but they're hidden from you if you're in the vSphere web client. But here in the orchestrator client, we can see them. If I expand here, notice that my VM folders, hmm, a little interesting, not quite certain where my VM folders are hiding. Looks like I've got a little bit of investigating to do. Okay, so uh, you will automatically have a data center folder created for you. These uh, four folders here and another folder, it's kind of a folder, a folder called resources. That's where your resource pools get created. So resources is our uh, top level resource pool. Okay, so why am I mentioning all these things? The reason why I'm mentioning all these things is you need to understand the inventory when you uh, do orchestrator development where you're integrating with the vCenter server. So let's actually write a workflow. I'm gonna go over to the workflows tab. Tell you what, let me go full screen here. So I'm going over to the workflows tab and in here, we're gonna create a new workflow. Tell you what, this is totally different from Hello World, so I'm gonna create a new folder called Real World. And in Real World, I'm going to create a workflow called uh, My VM Creating Workflow. So this is my workflow that's gonna create VMs. I'll click OK and I'll type a description. This workflow creates a virtual machine. All right, so we've done all that. And what we're gonna do is jump straight over to the schema tab. Now in this schema tab, we could conceivably drag out a scriptable task and write all the Java code, excuse me, Java script code necessary to uh, speak through the vSphere Web Services API to the vCenter server to create a virtual machine. But we don't have to. We don't have to write that code from scratch. In fact, we don't have to write any code at all. Because so what we can do is drag this workflow element. This element, when we drag it and drop it, will ask us what workflow would you like us to call from your workflow? So you might think of, uh, you might call your workflow the outer workflow and this workflow that we're dragging the inner workflow. So right now, the window that pops up is asking me, uh, what do you want that inner workflow to be? What workflow do you want to call? Now I happen to know the name of the workflow I'm gonna call is called Create Simple 
virtual machine. There's actually a number of different workflows that create virtual machines. I'm choosing this one because out of all of them, it's the simplest. So I'm going to say I want to call create simple virtual machine. And as you can see, uh, something I mentioned before called the setup wizard pops up, but we're not going to use the setup wizard this, this time around. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this workflow that I just embedded. In fact, whenever I drag out a workflow, or from that matter, any of these other workflow schema elements or this action, any time I drag those out, the very first thing I do is edit the workflow and I go look at what the input parameters and output parameters are for this workflow. Now, let's hit edit. You know that one way I can do that is to go to the in tab and or the out tab. But I want to take us on a journey to something new called the visual binding tab. Just like the in out tabs allow you to do binding, so does the visual binding tab. So what we see here, let me reposition this. What we see here in the visual binding tab is uh, three major sections. There's an outer column here on the left, an outer column on the right. Those two columns are describing variables in my workflow. And this intersection is describing the variables that are defined in the workflow that we're calling. So these outer columns are for the variables in the outer workflow. As you can see, I don't have any. And in this inner part, these are variables for the inner workflow. Now, this workflow that we're about to call, Create Simple Virtual Machine, will do all the hard work for us. But we have a contract that we have to satisfy. And that contract, uh, simply stated, says that we have to hook up all of his input parameters and output parameters to variables in our workflow. So let's start doing that. Uh, I'm going to start by Clicking here on this first variable called VM name, uh, as you might imagine, this string variable called VM name is used to pass in the name of the virtual machine that we want created. And what I'm going to do is click here on this triangle and drag and drop either up here or down here. If I drag and drop into this white space here on the left side, that's instructing orchestrator that we want it to create us a new input parameter. On the other hand, if I were to click and drag into the lower left hand corner, that would instruct orchestrator that we want it to create a new attribute. So in this particular case, I'm going to create an input parameter. I'm just clicking and dragging and dropping. And a familiar looking window shows up. Now, a few things are different in this window. For instance, uh, when we saw this window before, it was used to create new variables. And again, it's being used to create new variables. But notice, whereas before we had two choices, two radio buttons here, that allowed us to create either an input parameter or an attribute. In this case, they've completely hidden the attribute button because by virtue of dragging and dropping over here, we've already told Orchestrator that we want it to create an, an input parameter. All right, it's an input parameter, so we're, we, the developer, don't get to set the value. Uh, but we do have some things we can set, including the name. Now, remember, this window that's popped up here is for defining a new variable in our workflow. This is the name that's going to be assigned to that variable, unless, of course, I change it. Notice that the name that it's going to give our variable, by default, matches the name of the variable in the workflow that we're calling. But if we want to, we can change that name. For instance, maybe I want to be a little bit more wordy here. Maybe I want to call my, my variable virtual machine name. So the inner workflow's variable name is VM name. Mine is virtual machine name, but we're linking them together. But typically, the actually not typically, when you come into this interface, this value that you originally saw here matches the name of the same variable in the other workflow that you're calling, but you can change the name if you want. Same thing's true with this description. The default description that we see here for our variable in the workflow is just um, copied from the description of the variable in the workflow that we're calling. Now there's an interesting thing that's going on here, which is uh, if you notice, I, I can't do I can't do any searching, I can't pick anything except for a string. And for that matter, I also can't choose array, 
or single because when you are clicking from this middle section to the outer portions, what you're doing is creating variables in your workflow that are binding to his workflows. And whenever you do that, whenever you bind to somebody else's variables, your type has to match his. So this is his type for his variable. Our variable has to be the exact same type. So I actually can't change these. All right, so having done that, we've now set up one of the parameters that's required to, in order to satisfy the contract of Create Simple Virtual Machine. Now I'm gonna jump around a bit here and go to some of the other easy inputs. So Create Simple Virtual Machine has another input parameter it calls VM Memory Size. And I could click and drag to make it an input parameter, but I'm actually gonna make all the rest of these attributes. I'll explain why later on, but I'm gonna make the rest attributes. So if I click, and let's see, let's do VM uh, number of CPUs first. If I click on v the triangle by VM number of CPUs, it drag and drop to the lower left-hand corner, that's gonna create an attribute. Again, the same type of window pops up as before. Uh, in this case, in, for all the, all the remaining variables, I'm gonna go with the default name, default description. You know that I could change them, but to go quicker here, I'm just gonna go with the, the defaults. And I can't change the type again. And you know why there's only one radio button here. What's left here is a text box where I could set the value for the number of CPUs. For instance, I could type one. I want the virtual machine to have one CPU. Now I can do a similar thing for VM memory size. I'll click and drag to the lower left to create an attribute. I'll go with the default name, default description. Only thing I can really do in here if besides changing those is to set the value. I'm gonna create a wimpy little machine that's 256, well, what is that? 256 bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes. Uh, take a look on the screen if you can figure out which it is. And once you see on the screen where I, I know that it's megabytes. Once you see on the screen where I figured out it's megabytes, look at the label of that field and you'll notice it says description. At, at the beginning of this video series, I told you it's super important to type descriptions. So descriptions are important in cases like this because when you are calling somebody else's workflow, you want them to provide a description that gives enough information so that you know how to answer the question involved here. So this is 256 megabytes. So let this be a reminder that you should always type descriptions. I'm going to next do disk size. I'm going to give this virtual machine a 100 gigabyte disk. Now in my lab environment, I don't actually have that much space. So I'm going to also set up this disk thin, pro what is that, disk thin Pravi? What's disk thin Pravi? Uh, I'm sure by now you've noticed the dot, dot, dot here. The columns are too small to display these names fully. You could resize the columns and that does in fact work. But I'd like to show you another trick that I think you'll find more useful. Notice that whenever I select a variable, whether I'm selecting a variable in the middle or over on the side, whenever I select a variable like this one on the bottom here, on the very bottom of this window, it tells you the full name of the, var of the variable, tells you its type, and it tells us the description. So this one's a Boolean that's asking whether we want thin provision disk. I'm gonna create an attribute, and I'm gonna say yes I do because in my VRO lab environment, which is running with multiple other machines on my laptop, I don't have that much disk space. Okay, so let's see here. Those are easy ones. Uh, let's do something a little harder. VM guest OS. Again, I'm going to set this one up as an input parameter. Excuse me, not an input parameter, but rather a attribute. And in this case here, I'll go with all the defaults, but I'm going to click on value to set the value. What it's asking for by using this thing called a VC colon virtual machine guest OS identifier, what it's asking for here is for us to pick what operating system we plan on installing in this machine. So I could choose Windows, different versions of Windows. I'm just gonna choose DOS. It's a tiny machine and I'm not actually gonna power it on. Uh, by the way, notice in this chooser window, if you single click, if you had gotten one or more items in this list, if you single click them, it gives you more details. To actually select it, you double click. So DOS will be our guest operating system. 
And now we've got some other fields. And in fact, all these other fields are related to what I was talking about when I took you over into the web client a little while ago. So for instance, we need to pick what host we want the virtual machine on. So I'm going to click and drag to the lower left to create an attribute. I'll go with the defaults, except down on the bottom, I'm going to set which host I want the virtual machine to run on. So I'll click not set. And what's popped up here is something called the tree browser window. Whenever you see the tree browser window, train yourself to look at the title bar, look at what's in parentheses. For instance, here it says VC colon host system. That's telling you what type of object you're supposed to select here. If you haven't typed the, selected the right type of object, you won't be able to continue. This button will be grayed out. So we're looking for a VC colon host system, or you and I just call those hosts, like an ESXi host. So I'm gonna drill down through this inventory. Uh, notice the, the button, select button still grayed out, so that's not the right type of object. That's not the right type of object. As I keep drilling down, uh, you can see what type of object you're looking at by looking over here, but we're trying to find a VC colon host system. So let me keep expanding. And when I get this far, you're possibly going to be tempted to choose host, but notice it's still grayed out because this thing called host is not a VC colon host system. It's a VC colon host folder. It's not a host, it's a host folder. So we're not quite where we want to be. I'll click the down arrow. And now I can see what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a host. So I'm going to pick host ESXi01. Uh, actually, what you see here, and I forgot about this, I usually am working with a cluster. Uh, this thing here is called a cluster compute resource. A cluster compute resource can hold clusters or standalone hosts. Uh, I know this is labeled ESXi01, but because this is a cluster compute resource and not a host system, we still haven't quite found what we're looking for. But if you go down one more level, here's your host. That's a host system. We wanted a host system. We found a host system. I'll select it and then I'll hit OK. I'm just going to keep doing these other um, inputs. So VM folder, I'm going to set up as an attribute and I'll set its value. Again, I'll go drilling down through the inventory. Uh, I don't know about you, but in the beginning I loved being forced to use this tree browser because it really forced me to understand the hierarchy of objects. Um, come to class or watch some of my other videos and I'll teach you how you can turn that from a tree browser into something else like a drop-down list. But we'll hit OK here. Let's see, what else do we have? Uh, let's do VM network. Uh, by the way, you'll notice I'm running out of white space. We're going to have to do something about that in a moment. But I'm clicking and dragging VM network down to the lower left-hand corner. And again, I'll go with the default values, but I need to pick a network, so I click Not Set. We're in tree browser, so we always look at the title bar. We're looking for a VC colon network. And uh, incidentally, VC colon network is for a network on a standard virtual switch. There's a different uh, data type for distributed switch. So I'm going looking in our inventory for a virtual machine port group on a standard virtual switch. I'll find that down under network. I uh, have one here called VM network. That's the icon for a standard virtual switch based network. All right, we're getting there. A couple more. VM data store, that's the data store we want the virtual machine to be installed into. I'll click and drag to the lower left. I've got a little bit more white space left. I dra drag and drop in there, go with the default values. Let's go pick a data store. And again, drilling down through the inventory. We go into the data store folder. And I'm going to make certain that uh, where possible, I would choose a shared data store. That's the, uh, the reason why I do that is if it's a shared data store that both hosts can see, then I don't have to worry about making certain that I'm landing on the right data store. But I'm pretty certain that this data store, which is a local data store, is from host ESXi01, which is the same machine where I'm running the virtual machine. So I'll click Select and OK. And as far as inputs, there's one input left, which is this VM resource pool. Now, previously I've been telling you to drag and drop on white space, but we've run out of white space down here. 
not to worry if you click and drag if you have no white space just drag on this name type uh, column header and it'll do the same thing so I'm going to go with the default values here I'm going to click not set to pick the resource pool and if we keep going down a little bit further and further and further we're looking for a resource pool so under host there's the cluster compute resource under this host there should be and there is a resource pool I will click select and OK now we've been doing quite a, a bit of work here uh, no, nobody ever said that doing binding uh, was super fast actually if you do want it to be super fast you'd be using the setup wizard but there's a fair amount of work in setting up uh, parameter binding if you're thinking to yourself wow this is a lot of work um, it's a lot less work than it would take in other programming languages where you where you don't have parameter binding in other programming environments you would have to write a whole bunch of code we haven't written any code yet but I, I want to acknowledge uh, if you've been following along and actually doing this we've done a, quite a bit of work here so we deserve some sort of reward well our reward here is that create simple virtual machine the workflow that we're calling is going to create a virtual machine for us and it's also been kind enough that it set up an output parameter that will give us an object that contains that virtual machine I'll show you why that's important in a bit here but uh, you might be tempted to create an output parameter but again I gave you a a beginner's rule which is don't create an output parameter instead create an attribute again I'll click and drag I've run out of white space but I can drop drag and drop on the name type column headers I'll go with all the defaults and uh, including the value here I'm not going to set the value of new VM because the workflow I'm calling is going to set its value so I'll click OK uh, let's see I'll scoot the window up I'll click close I'll cross my fingers and click validate and my workflow is valid so why don't we actually give it a try here I'm going to run the workflow and notice it only asks one question because I only have one input parameter on the other hand if we were to call create simple virtual machine directly it had loads and loads of input parameters so what I've actually managed to do here is to wrap a an overly complicated workflow in my workflow and my workflow has simplified things tremendously that's a technique known as wrapping it's typically used I shouldn't say typically it's oftentimes used to take an overly complex workflow and wrap it with something that's simpler but you can actually do it the opposite direction too if you have a workflow that's overly simplistic and you want to add some functionality to it just wrap it in your own workflow and after doing that uh, you can within your workflow do whatever additional um, error checking or add whatever functionality you want to make for a more complex workflow but I'm going to create a virtual machine called my new virtual machine and I'm going to run this workflow when I run this workflow we cross our fingers but let's see what actually happens here does it run did it run successfully it did uh, one reason why you might at times not see your workflow run successfully is if you didn't set the value for all those attributes the ones that need value set um, your workflow will typically blow up but you can come to the general tab find your variables your your attributes and if necessary set their values here but I don't need to do that because you saw me do it from the visual binding tab what I've got here though is a completed workflow if I want to I can go look at the logs and maybe it'll tell me something interesting but what I really want to do is go over to the vSphere web client in the vSphere web client let's see what we've got going on here we've got I probably need to do a refresh here over in the vSphere web client in the here we go in the vvork folder huh there's my virtual machine folder uh, I earlier you may have noticed uh, I, I tried to create a VM folder and it didn't show up where I want I think I was just right clicking in the wrong place uh, it is by the way about 1 30 in the morning as I record this but notice here's my new virtual machine we created stop and think about this we just created a virtual machine in our workflow without writing any code at all 
And I can use that same technique, as long as I understand parameter binding, I can use that same technique to not just create VMs, but other types of objects too, like clusters and data stores. And not only can I create those things, I can manage them, I can um, uh, turn on VMs, put hosts in the maintenance mode. I can do all sorts of things. And in fact, we'll see how to do th those sorts of things in the next video. But I want to end this video with one more quick little modification to our workflow. So far, we haven't written any code, but I want to show you, if you learn a little bit of code, how you can do some very cool things. So I'm going to drag in a scriptable task, after, place it after the workflow that I'm calling. And what I'm going to do is edit the bindings for this scriptable task. And in here, uh, let's use visual binding. In here, I'm going to go find that new VM variable. Remember, new VM was created by the uh, workflow that builds virtual machines. So what I can do is take that variable, it's got a virtual machine in it, and bring it into my workflow. But I don't want to bring it into this. I want to bring it into this guy here. So let me click here. I'm going to find new VM, and I'm going to click and drag to bring new VM into that scriptable task. And over in that scriptable task scripting tab, I'm going to type, actually I don't have to type it, I can just click it. I'm going to click on new VM, and I can type new VM dot, and if I know the name of the method, like power on, I can type the name of the method. But notice if you say object, like new VM, dot, and then control space, you'll get a drop down list, which I actually can't show on, oh, actually I can, there we go. So. Uh, sometimes on my Macintosh, I have control space mapped out to other things. Apparently I don't right now, but by typing control space after that dot, I get a list of methods that I can call on that, that new VM, including things like, whoops, just went past it. I could call the power on method. And also I have these red guys here are all sorts of properties of the VM. For instance, if I've forgotten what the name of the VM was that I created, I can say new VM dot name and it'll tell me the name. But what I want to do is call a method. Which method? I want to call the method called power on VM task. And uh, while I could pass in a, a host that I want the virtual machine to boot up on, uh, that's actually an optional parameter according to the API Explorer. So this should be enough. Simple line of code. Let's click close. I'm going to save. Let me validate the workflow to make certain everything looks good. Looks good. So I'm going to run the workflow. Uh, to make clear that this is a new virtual machine. I'm going to call this new virtual machine, my new virtual machine two. submit the workflow. And with just that little bit of code added, we can go over to the vSphere web client, watch the machine as it's being created. And I need to resize a little bit here. Notice that I have a new virtual machine and it's powered on. So with just one very, very short line of code, I'm performing actions on the newly created virtual machine. So we've done a ton of great work here. It's time for us to, to, to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, there is one more video in this video series. That's video number 10. And we're going to uh, keep doing the same type of stuff that we're doing here, but we're going to do even more fancy stuff. So see you in video number 10.